Millions of years ago, the powerful forces that lie dormant inside the Earth pushed up the coast of the region of Patagonia in Argentina. The coast was transformed and a new peninsula rose up from the sea. The cliffs along this shore still today retain the traces of their past beneath the ocean, fossils that testify to the amazing variety of life forms which already in distant times inhabited these waters. This profusion of life still exists and forms the basis of the diet of the thousands of marine mammals that every year come here to breed. The Valdez Peninsula has become a unique refuge for those marine animals that require solid land on which to bring their young into the world. Sea lions and elephant seals periodically occupy its beaches in an annual cycle which has continued uninterrupted for thousands of years. Like them, the southern right whales also come here each year to procreate. The peninsula is today one of the last places on Earth where these giants of the sea can find refuge. As every year when June comes around, the southern right whales reach the calm waters of the Nuevo and San Jose Gulfs. They remain here until November when they move to the cold waters of the South Atlantic in search of krill, a tiny crustacean which forms their basic diet. Fourteen meters long and weighing 35,000 kilos, they are the largest of the visitors to the peninsula. The cloudy waters in which they swim are full of microorganisms which constitute the basis of this profusion of animal life. They are the food of the crustaceans and fish, which in turn will be eaten by the large marine mammals that visit the peninsula. The origin of such abundance lies in the strategic location of this land. The Valdez Peninsula is in the region of North Patagonia in Argentina, in an area where warm sea currents from the north meet colder ones from the south, thereby creating ideal conditions for the development of a great diversity of marine life. A very different situation from that on land, where the flora and fauna must struggle to survive in a far more hostile environment. The cold lands of the peninsula receive little rain, less than 250 millimeters a year. The vegetation is almost exclusively composed of small bushes and grasses, which are buffeted by the constant winds blowing across the region in gusts of up to 100 kilometers an hour. The local fauna has also had to adapt to these conditions, and what better protection from the cold than a thick coat of wool?
The guanacos are the largest members of the camel family in South America and the ones that have best adapted to the harsh conditions of the peninsula. Although, for some of their neighbors, on the other hand, the Valdez Peninsula is a paradise compared to the cold waters of the Atlantic. The peninsula presents one more obstacle for the local fauna to overcome. As a consequence of the climatic conditions, there is very little vegetation on the plains and nowhere to hide. For the guanacos, this is no problem, but for the Mara or Patagonian hare, this is a serious drawback. The maras, which are not hares at all, despite the name, must be constantly on the alert for possible predators. So much so that its teats have evolved towards a lateral position, behind the elbows, so they can feed their young without having to lie down. In addition, the young are able to run just a few minutes after being born. In a place with no protection, the only defense is flight, and the body of the Mara has been designed with this in mind from the very first moments of its life. In the 19th century, a new species joined the local fauna of the region, the domesticated sheep. Though the land is very poor and so useless for agriculture, its wide plains can support extensive grazing, and from early on, sheep and cattle farming became the main activity across the vast expanses of Patagonia. The arrival of the sheep meant not only a new species competing for the scarce pasture of the region, it also brought with it indiscriminate hunting of the local fauna. Either because they were a threat to the sheep, or for their meat, or in the case of the birds, their feathers, guanacos and rares were subjected to enormous hunting pressure, which drastically reduced their numbers. Today, fortunately, the different species that live on the peninsula are protected and no longer have to worry about attacks from humans, only the natural predators that still inhabit the peninsula. Like the Mara, the Amadillo lives in a state of constant alert and it runs off at any suspicious noise. The fox is not a dangerous predator, but you can never be too careful, especially when you're a long way from your burrow. The only way to feel safe is to dig a new one, and fast. The main value of the Valdez Peninsula is, however, not to be found inland, but along the coast, where life is much more profuse. The sea that bathes these coasts teems with life and provides food for the colonies of sea lions, elephant seals and penguins that live here. Over 100 species of austral birds nest along the coast and come to the beach in search of food. Some of them, such as the seagulls, have seen their numbers rise in recent years as a result of the growth of local waste dumps, which have become another source of food for these voracious birds.
Alongside them live the South American sea lions, also called sea wolves, or fur seals due to the clump of fur around the head of the males. The total population on the Valdez Peninsula is estimated to be around 20,000, the majority of them females who each year give birth to hundreds of pups on these beaches. The conditions are so favorable for them that their numbers rise a little each year. The waters around the peninsula must have sufficient reserves of food to sustain these growing colonies of mammals and seabirds. Part of these reserves is revealed at low tide. The beaches are then covered with a multicolored blanket of vegetable, animal and mineral remains washed ashore by the currents. Most of it is seaweed, but there are also mollusks cast onto land by the sea. The local birds are quick to take advantage of this gift. The protective shells of the bivalves are no obstacle. The seagulls have discovered an infallible method of getting through them. When they find one, they take it in their beaks and fly up with it. The seagull soars up and when it thinks it is high enough, drops its precious load. After one or more attempts, the shell will crash against a rock and break apart, and dinner is served. Just a few meters away, the sea lions doze on the sand. In the water, they are extremely active, but on land, they become lazy. Their clumsiness out of water and the pleasant warmth of the sun are more than reason enough to take life easy, and the colonies gather to slumber on the beach for hours at a time. The sea lions remain along these coasts all year round. During the breeding season, the colonies gather at two places, one at either extreme of the peninsula, Punta Pirámides in the south and Punta Norte in the north. The pups also enjoy the afternoon sun. They are still very small and don't have the layer of fat necessary to survive in the freezing cold waters of the Atlantic. For the time being, their life is more terrestrial than marine, though not for long. The beaches of Punta Norte are also a meeting point for another member of the seal family, the elephant seal. The elephant seals are the largest members of the seal family in the world. The females can weigh up to 500 kilos, but even they are lightweights compared to the male. This male is almost five meters long and weighs around 2,500 kilos, almost 10 times as much as a sea lion. The Valdez Peninsula is the only continental region where elephant seals have established a breeding colony. The clumsiness of both the sea lions and the elephant seals on land contrasts with their incredible agility in the water. Their legs have evolved into flippers and have conserved almost nothing of their former function. Only the claws at their ends remind us that once they were used to run across the ground.
The layer of fat that surrounds them and their ability to restrict blood circulation at the periphery of their bodies enable them to remain in the cold waters of the peninsula for hours on end. There they play, hunt, and may even sleep. In the middle of the year, a new sound can be heard in the sea. The southern right whale has returned to the Valdez Peninsula. Every year, some 600 individuals of this species come to the calm waters of the San Jose and Nuevo Gulfs. Like the sea lions and elephant seals, the whales are mammals which have adapted to marine life, but they have gone one step further down this evolutionary path. Their extremities bear no reminder of their former life on land, and their enormous weight means they are unable to leave the sea. And nor do they need to, because the whales, unlike the sea lions and elephant seals, reproduce in the water. Despite the richness of these cloudy waters, the whales do not come to the Valdez Peninsula to feed. In fact, during their stay here, they fast, living on the fat reserves they have accumulated during their time out in the open ocean. But the waters of the peninsula continue to be their chosen destination for two fundamental reasons. This is where they mate and give birth. There was a time when this image was on the verge of disappearing. The slowness of the right whale, the fact it floats when dead, and the enormous quantities of fat on their bodies made them a prized target for the whale hunters. The Valdez Peninsula was no longer a safe haven, and little by little the whales stopped coming here. Even after they were declared a protected species, it was years before these cetaceans returned to their old sanctuary to once more breed. Today, over 50 years after the ban on hunting, the coast is again a place where both adults and young can peacefully swim in safe waters. Mother and child remain together for a year, which is how long breastfeeding lasts. This dependency and the long pregnancy means they can only reproduce every three years, and so recovering the population is a slow process. From when they are young, the right whales develop calluses on their heads, which distinguish them from other cetaceans. These calluses are colonized by enormous numbers of small, whitish, parasitic crustaceans. And to free themselves of these, the whales employ a truly spectacular method. According to some zoologists, these impressive leaps serve to get rid of the parasites, though others believe they do it simply for fun. Whatever the purpose, it is a spectacular demonstration of their incredible power, capable of lifting these monsters right out of the water. At birth, these whales measure five meters in length and can weigh over 2,000 kilos. 
and that is just a start. During the first two months of their lives, they grow three and a half centimeters a day, a record in the animal kingdom. During these first stages of growth, the mother is extremely attentive to her child, even helping it to breathe by swimming beneath it and lifting it up to the surface. With a ban on hunting, we might think that these giant cetaceans have nothing to fear. But unfortunately, peace does not always reign in this natural paradise. A wound is a sure sign that predators are around. The orcas, or killer whales, have come to the Valdez Peninsula attracted by the abundance of prey swimming in these waters. The orcas are the only predators, apart from man, who represent a danger for the right whales. The adults are not easy prey, but a young whale caught alone stands no chance against a family of orcas and its coordinated attacks. The mothers become extremely vigilant, gather together in groups and surround the young in order to defend them. These, unaware of the danger, continue to play quite happily. While their mothers are close by, the young whales feel protected, even when there are killer whales prowling around in the vicinity. A change in the weather marks the arrival of the southern spring, and the peninsula receives one of the last rains that will fall here in the rest of the year. The sea lions have not yet moved to their breeding grounds. They are in the south of the peninsula, and also threatened by the most feared of all visitors. A family of orcas prowls along the coast in search of food. This time, however, their target is not the sea lions, but relatives of theirs who have already begun breeding. The female elephant seals are now in heat. The males, who had already established their territories and harems in August, must again defend them. The young are repelled with ease, but when the competitor is an adult, a terrible clash is inevitable. With their sharp teeth, the males try to wound their opponent on the neck or head.
And this is the victor's spoils, an entire harem of 14 females that the defending male had managed to collect as a result of innumerable fights. A prize well worth the effort. On this occasion, he has again been able to retain control over his harem, but this will not be the last time he will have to fight. In the course of the month, each of the females will come into heat, and other pretenders will seek to conquer his fiefdom. After the battle, the victor exercises his rights over the females he owns. The female has little to say in matters of reproduction. The master of the harem, aroused by the combat, assails his mate, immobilizing her beneath his 2,000 kilos in weight, and copulates. The difference in size makes any attempt at resistance futile. During the breeding season, the male does not eat, and so after 10 weeks of fasting and intense exercise, his weight can drop by as much as 40%. For the time being, however, his strength remains intact, and he demonstrates it by mounting all the females in the harem as they come into heat. The females are not all receptive at the same time. The last ones to arrive on the peninsula are not yet ready to mate. They still have three weeks of breastfeeding, during which time the fur of the young will change from black to gray, and they will put on weight. At birth, they weigh 45 kilos, which will rise to 250 kilos at the end of this period. The females also do not eat during this time, and so if they have not accumulated sufficient reserves, they will not be able to provide their young with enough nutrition to guarantee their survival. This pup has been abandoned by its mother and will very quickly die of starvation. As the breeding season of the elephant seals comes to an end, that of their close relatives, the sea lions, begins. The males arrived around the middle of December in order to stake out their territories and wait for the females. Since then, there have been constant fights among them, though generally threats are enough to dissuade the weaker one from any attempt to fight. The females arrive shortly after, and after giving birth, they are again ready to breed. They can copulate from one to three times, and not always with the same male. They all arrive at the same time, and the breeding season can last for two months. This is a severe test for the males, who during all this time do not eat and hardly sleep. Gradually, their strength diminishes, and competitors prowling around the harems manage to escape their vigilance and copulate with a female even if it is in secret and beneath the water.
Unlike the elephant seals, the female sea lions do go into the sea to feed during the time they are breastfeeding. Meanwhile, their young wait for them on the beach, unprotected. The pups are very vulnerable and many die before they reach maturity. The petrels know this and keep a careful watch from up in the air to be the first to spot the dead bodies. Before long, they discover one among the waves. The high mortality rate in the colonies and the large number of placentas the mothers leave lying on the beaches are an important source of food for the birds. Thousands of petrels, seagulls and cormorants enjoy a period of abundance which can last throughout the entire southern summer. The shore is almost as dangerous as the sea. Another pup is being killed, this time crushed beneath an adult male as he fought to defend his harem. This is an everyday occurrence in the colony, but the mother continues to protect it, unable to accept its death. The last females come into heat in March. As the breeding season comes to an end, the harem split up. The sea lions swim out to sea in search of food and again move to the winter colonies where they will remain until the following summer. The young have to be prepared for this long swim and now take their first dips in the sea. Little by little they approach the water and swimming lessons begin. The first few weeks are the most dangerous for them. Not only do they have to worry about predators and the adult males that might crush them at any time, they must also be beware of males who have not yet quite reached maturity. Unlike the females, they don't protect them, and on occasions they may attack them and even kill them. The males of the species are not renowned for their paternal instincts. Around this time of year, in the middle of February, the sea lions receive the second visit of their most feared predators, the killer whales. The orcas also have young who must be taught how to hunt, and the peninsula is the best training ground. The sea lion colonies are full of young, inexperienced pups playing on the shore and hundreds of adults going into and out of the sea to feed. Food is everywhere, and what's more, it's easy to catch. With the enemy around, everyone is on their guard. This is a single family group, and it's on the watch scanning the beach in search of prey. They won't have long to wait. After waiting for them to pass by, a sea lion decides to enter the sea. 
The female leading the group of orcas has seen it, and they all turn back. It's the chance they've been waiting for. The sea lion has just realized, but now it's too late. Its fate has been decided. The male desperately tries to reach the shore, his only hope of salvation. But he has swum too far out, and the orcas will not let him escape. The young actively participate in hunting. They have to learn how to kill and dodge the attacks of the wounded sea lion. The killer whales are in no hurry. The victim is fatally wounded and has no chance of escaping. Better to be patient and wait for it to weaken while they practice attacks on it. After several minutes of fighting, the sea lion is as far away from the coast as at the start. All efforts will be futile against one of the largest and most intelligent predators in the ocean. The killer whales attack in family groups led by the oldest female. Each group has its own communication sounds and hunting techniques which they practice with their young. This organization enables them to hunt not only fish, sea lions, and elephant seals, but even sharks and large cetaceans. Little by little, blood loss and the exertion weaken the prey. Attacks become increasingly slow and spaced out. Very soon it will no longer be able to defend itself and will die. After a struggle that has lasted over 45 minutes, the elephant seal dies and is devoured by the family of killer whales. Slowly, calm returns to the sea. During all these months, the Valdez Peninsula is home to birds that have adapted to marine life better than any other, the penguins. There are over half a million Patagonian or Magellanic penguins in the various colonies established on the peninsula and the surrounding region. They have been almost six months living in the waters of the Atlantic and now return to breed in the lands where they were born. In the middle of August, the first males arrive along the coast. They have come to get the nest ready before their partners arrive. Like a procession, they all march inland, looking for the same hole they used last year. If they find it, they will have to prepare it and defend it from the males who have come for the first time and want a ready-made home. In just a short time, the nesting areas are full of clean nesting holes, each one guarded over by a male. In the middle of September, the females arrive. Penguins are monogamous, so last year's couples will reunite. Newcomers will need to take great care in the construction of their nests in the hope of being chosen by one of the single females. The 
Their breeding colonies are inland, almost 600 meters from the beaches. Here, the ground is solid, and there is no danger of flooding, though they do run the risk of their eggs being trodden on by a careless guanaco or rare. The most sought after nests are those beneath bushes where the plants will offer protection from the sun. Once they have been reunited with their mates, the courtship begins, a ritual of dances, flapping of wings and clacking of beaks. When the ceremony is over, copulation takes place and will be repeated several times in the course of the next few hours. A few days later, the females lay two eggs which will be incubated by both parents for 40 days. While one remains in the nest, the other goes into the sea to feed. Their wings converted into flippers and their tapered bodies enable them to reach underwater speeds of up to 24 kilometers an hour, an impressive achievement for a bird. This adaptation is fundamental as they spend almost half the year living day and night in the ocean. There they eat, drink, play and sleep. Once they have satisfied their hunger, they quickly return to the nest where their partner is waiting for the change of guard. The eggs must never be left unattended because foxes, petrels, skyuas and seagulls are always around waiting for a chance to take them. To prevent them from being stolen, the penguins dig holes up to one meter long. Even so, many eggs and chicks are lost and it's rare for all a couple's offspring to survive. After hours waiting and watching, a seagull has discovered two unprotected nests together and swoops down on them. Though there are many other nests nearby, no neighbor risks abandoning their own eggs to defend someone else's. The parents' carelessness will prove fatal. Many others, having seen the seagull land, approach hoping for an opportunity, and some of them are rewarded. The presence of predators raises the alarm in the colony. But in vain, the parents will not arrive in time to avoid the tragedy none of their eggs will be saved. of the nests that have been attacked are at this moment 800 meters away on the coast. Both they and the other penguins have not dared enter the sea for some minutes now. Another group of killer whales has approached the coast close by. This time, however, the predators are not out hunting but training. 
The adults are going to teach their young an exclusive technique they have developed here on the peninsula. The beaches of the Valdez Peninsula are steeply sloped, so just a few meters offshore, the killer whales can swim quite freely. This characteristic allows the predators to patrol the coast and use a hunting technique which is unique in the world. The killer whales localize the sea lions on the shore, and once they have chosen their target, launch themselves onto the beach. They'll be stranded on the sand, but with the slope, it won't be too difficult to return to the water. Young and adults practice the maneuvers several times on the deserted beach. If they don't become expert in the technique, the risk of becoming stranded forever on land is very high. The young also have to learn that this technique only works at high tide. At low tide, the beaches are not sufficiently sloped to be able to successfully carry out an attack. If they try, they will almost certainly get stuck long before reaching the shore. The class is over. Little by little, the family of killer whales moves away from the coast closely watched by the penguins and the sea lions who finally can return to the water. The young, like those of any species, take advantage of the rest to play together while the group moves off into the sea. Another day is coming to an end. The temperature starts to fall and the different species that live on the peninsula take advantage of the final minutes of light before returning to their burrows. Slowly, calm returns to the waters of the peninsula. Penguins, sea lions, and elephant seals have returned to the shore to spend the night. Only the whales break the silence at dusk. The Valdez Peninsula is today a unique and irreplaceable refuge for the wildlife of South America. Human presence, the first signs of which date back 3,200 years, has not managed to destroy this natural paradise. After many years of hunting and cattle farming, the Argentinian government decided to protect the peninsula and turned it into a wildlife reserve. Another Eden has been saved. Today, the whaling ships have been replaced by boats carrying tourists from all corners of the world. Tourists who come here to see this remote peninsula, which in the past the sailors called the refuge of the monsters.